Okay, I'm going to start off tonight with an apology. I apologize for not being a teacher that is good with maps because you wish, you're going to wish I was better with maps. I don't do maps at all. I know about them, but I don't use them uh, in teaching because it, it was too cumbersome to do. And if I was the qualified TI person I should be, I would have uh, them on uh, some kind of PowerPoint. We could look at them and it'd be wonderful, but I don't. So here's what I recommend. If you have a Bible with you that has map, maps, uh, it might be helpful. We'll give you some direction on that. If not, and you've got your phone, you can get on the internet and look up uh, the land of uh, Palestine and it'll give you a map there you can look at. Because what we're going to start on <clears throat> tonight and, and go for a while, I just don't know how long, is the next issue with premillennialism that uh, is, a, is a difficulty. Is that on his way? I don't know. Okay. I came straight from work over well, here. Well, <laughs> we were all wondering, you see. Okay, um, so uh, what we're gonna look at tonight is the land promise. Now, uh, the premillennialist believe that God had yet to fulfill the land promise he made to Abraham and uh, and to the, uh, and finally, of course, to the Israelites in general. They do not believe that has ever been reached yet. Now, here's the reason. If you will look or don't look, just take my word for it for now. But in Genesis chapter uh, 15, when it talks about, this is connected with the uh, God talking to Abraham and making the promise, making him a great nation, and so forth and so on. All right. In the description of the land <clears throat> that God will give the Israelites, the promise is it will go from the Red Sea to the Euphrates River. Now, the Red Sea is over close to Egypt. You'll, you'll recall they crossed the Red Sea when they left Egypt to come in to Palestine, and the Euphrates is in the northwest area and very, very far north, okay? They believe uh, that both the scope and the duration of this promise have never been reached yet and will not be reached until when? Until the premillennial kingdom comes into existence. And then at that point, the Jews will receive all the land that God promised. All right. Now, the fact is that if you look at the land of Palestine now on a map, or even in, historically look at it, uh, it has not reached those borders. It, you know, the land of Palestine does not reach from the Euphrates River down to the uh, Red Sea. It just doesn't do it. So they claim then that if that's true, if it's true, they don't own it, don't control it, um, then it must be something yet to come. And they're using Bible to get there. They're using their logic of what, what God promised versus what God what the Israelites currently have, and therefore, uh, there, there's yet to, there, this is yet to take place, and someday they will receive it all in when the millennial kingdom comes. Now, this will explain to some degree why there is such an interest in the land of Israel and in that part of the country. And when I say the interest, I want to uh, preface that or refer to, if you have watched any of the, well, I shouldn't say any, but the vast majority of TV evangelists, okay, most of the TV evangelists are premillennial in their background. And so they're constantly bringing this up. And we want to protect Israel uh, politically, geographically, and every other way because they are, according to the understanding of most people in the world, they are still God's people. 
And the last thing you want to do is get crossways with God's people. You want to always be on the side of God's people. Even if you're an atheist, you still want to be on the side of God's people, which I think is interesting. You have people who don't necessarily even believe in God, but they're going to back the, the Jewish nation. Now, granted, Israel is a democracy, and politically that you know fits in with our understanding of how government should be run. But there's an undercurrent to that that goes beyond the political uh, ramifications and gets into the <clears throat> religious aspect of the reason uh, people want to protect and uh, uh, care for what goes on in, in, in Israel and specifically the area of Palestine. All right. Now, God gave it to them, yet they do not possess it. And he said, you will possess it. And they make this, they, they can look at the borders of Palestine and see they're nowhere close in proximity to the area that God said he would give them that would belong to them. And so they believe that it's not, it has not happened. Now, let me give you a possible uh, illustration that will help us understand where, where God, how God can do what God said he's going to do, and he's already done what God said he would do. And look at it this way. Now, suppose, for example, that you buy a house. And you, in the house that's yours, it's free and clear. You paid for it. It's your, it's, the bank has no interest in it. You own it all. Okay. And you, to save money because you paid so much for the house, you can't afford to run everything. So you decide you're going to cut the electric bill down by eliminating the use of three rooms. So you shut the air conditioner off, you shut the lights off, you lock the doors, and you live in, in the rest of the house, okay? Now, question, do you still own those three rooms? You still possess, do you possess those three rooms? Yes, you possess them. Are you choosing not to live in them? Yes, for whatever reason, but you still possess them. The same thing can be said of what's going on with Israel. Just because Israel did not go in and live in the area that God gave Israel does not necessarily mean that God, that God did not give it to them, that God did not fulfill his promise. That being, this is your land from the Euphrates to the Red, to the Red Sea, all right? Um, look at Joshua, turn to Joshua 21. This one's important when you're thinking about this particular um, problem or our concern. Joshua 21 and go to verse 43. It says, So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their forefathers. And they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them a rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their forefathers. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord handed all their enemies over to them. Not one of all of, God, of the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. It is hard to imagine how you can read that and conclude that somehow the Israelites got shortchanged and didn't get everything God gave them. What the, the problem is, is the way that the uh, premillennials want to view this. They want to look at it in today's terms and say, see, Israel, the Israelites don't possess all that land and therefore... God, full, God has not fulfilled his promise, which obviously goes in direct opposition to Joshua, who believed and knew that, he, that they had given it to him. So, you know, we've got a problem because it says very clearly 
that the Lord's good promises were fulfilled, it would be almost impossible to say that the fulfillment of the land promise uh, in a more straightforward manner. I mean, how, how do you, how can God say it any clearer than he allowed Joshua to say it when he said, we got it all, it's all ours, and all God's promises regarding the land have been fulfilled. So that's the first, if you will, uh, consideration of why the premillennial position doesn't really stand up very well with scripture. However, we don't want to just leave with one. We've got more uh, that further validates the point. Uh, look at Nehemiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 7. Nehemiah said, <coughs> You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees and named him Abraham. You, you found his heart faithful to you and you made a covenant with him to give to his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and uh, Gergesites. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. Nehemiah says, you gave them the land. All the land, with all these different people living in the land, you gave it to them, and uh, you have uh, kept your promise because you are righteous. There's no, there's no issue with Nehemiah that somehow God didn't fulfill his word. Now, uh, that would seem obvious to me that God gave him the land. However, uh, in his book, uh, John Walford, The Millennial Kingdom, uh, he says that the scripture is saying that God was simply being shown as faithful. Didn't mean that he'd fulfilled the promise. He'd been, full, he'd been faithful, of course. We would then come back and say, how, how was God shown to be faithful. He was shown to be faithful because he gave them the land he promised them. So I can agree with Mr. Walford on that point that it does show God to be faithful. That's true. But his the, the evidence of his faithful behavior was the fact that the, uh, the children of Abraham got the land that, that he was promised. Now, Look at 2 Samuel, chapter 8, and verse 3. I will not be able to pronounce the names in the sentence. I will tell you now. But it starts off with, moreover, David fought an individual who was the son of another individual who was king of a particular area. And the Zoba is the area when he went to restore his control along the Euphrates River. Okay, Zorba is a very small piece of ground close to, connected with the Euphrates River. Now, it says that he went to what? Restore his control. He lost control and he went up there to restore it. Now, you cannot restore something you never had. So, there, so obviously, David at one time controlled land where? Right next to the Euphrates River. So here God's promise is evidently fulfilled because David goes up there to restore the control he once had and therefore God's promise to give land to that boundary had in fact taken place. Now, look at 1 Kings chapter 4. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 21. 
And Solomon ruled over all his, all the kingdoms from the river of the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. These countries brought tribute and were Solomon's subject all his life. Now, where is the border of Egypt? How about the Red Sea? Okay, remember when we crossed the Red Sea, we left Egypt and went into the wilderness. Okay, so David went up and, and took control, back control of an area close to the Euphrates River. His son Solomon goes down and takes control of a, or, or continues his control of the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. So you have the border of Egypt mentioned in one place, you have the border of the Euphrates River mentioned in the other. What does that say? That says God gave them the land and they control it. Now, did they continually control? We'll get to that later. That's that's another issue. That's the other, that's the other half of the story. This is the first half. The first half is the land promise in terms of scope. The second part, which we'll get to next week, is the land promise in connection to duration of time. But we'll cover both. Today we're going to cover the scope. All right. Now, uh, in Exodus chapter 23, in verses 30 and 31, you'll find there that the land promise is even bigger. For it says, from the Red Sea to the wilderness and the Euphrates River, it's even bigger than, than the other. It's wider. Um, here's an interesting idea that kind of creates some issues when you start talking about um, the scope of this land. Moses, you'll recall, was leading the children of Israel. He took them and they were thirsty. And uh, he, he hit the rock and water came out the first time. And then the second time they were thirsty, that's recorded, uh, he was told to what? Speak to the rock. And he what? Struck the rock. Now, I want to make a point that I think there's two. There's an extra ingredient to this discussion. It is true, there's no doubt, that Moses disobeyed God by striking the rock. And God specifically said, speak to it. And he did, he struck it. However, in addition to that, if you read that particular scripture, you'll find that Moses said that he was, it says that Moses was angry at the people. And he said to the people, why must we bring you water? In other words, not only did Moses strike the rock and disobey God, but Moses took a position that was beyond his ability. For it was not Moses that brought them anything. And he failed to give God the credit. And in, re in result, he did not uh, do what God told him to do. So there's more. I'm not saying that hitting the rock wasn't enough. But if you want to question the idea of, well, that seems so trivial. You know, and what difference would it make to God? Well, you struck it or spoke to it. And suddenly, because of not, because he did not, Obey God. What happened? He was not allowed to enter the land of promise, the promised land uh, that that God had uh, arranged for the people to enter. And he missed the opportunity because of disobedience. All right. Now, the mountain on which Moses stood to look over into the promised land was within the boundaries that the Premillennialist Convents were part of the promised land. In other words, Moses is standing on land that they consider to be in 
the promised land, but God said, you can't go into the promised land. You can only look over and look at it. So you see, that's an issue here of how you define the land. You, Moses would have had been a long way off to have stood either outside of uh, over in Egypt or in the uh, past the Euphrates River to have looked over and, and seen the land from a mountain. The mountain was inside the land. So, so Moses was already there. So how does God keep Moses out of the promised land when he's already standing in the promised land? Looking over into the promised land. Okay, I hope that makes sense, but, but it illustrates the point that the promised land boundaries are not absolute, fixed, and never, never get talked about in different ways. And so while you can make the case that uh, did they or didn't they cover all this land, well, inside the land, inside the original boundaries that were set up, set in Genesis, you'll see Moses standing there, and yet God says, I'm not going to let you into the promised land. Well, the promised land and, and the land God promised in, uh, Abraham are, are the same thing, but the boundaries vary depending on what the circumstances are. The entire land mass or the promised land of Canaan, which is, uh, you know, Dan to, Be Dan to Beersheba, for example. Okay, is that the whole land or is that part of the land? But certainly part of the land, because it can't be from Euphrates to the to the Red Sea. So please understand that it's not something that you can take one set of one passage and say this is absolutely what God uh, intended for them to get and continually hold as in uh, forever and ever. We're gonna we're gonna come back to that point. All right, now. In both Numbers 31 and Numbers 34. I'm not as I'm not reading these scriptures, not because they're not there, it's because it gets very confusing. And <clears throat> you're welcome to find the scriptures and read them. But um, when they divided up the inheritance, when they divided up the inheritance of who which which son was gonna get which piece of property of Jacob's son. Uh, it's a smaller land than would be known as the promised land, okay? Within the promised land of Red Sea to Euphrates River, you have the area that was divided up and given to the different uh, uh, tribes. Uh, the, inheritance, the inheritance land was only land west of the Jordan River. Uh, northern boundary was Mount ha uh, Hamath, and the southern boundary was uh, Kadesh uh, Barnea. I mean, that's what it says. Now, that's the land they divided up. That's the land you recognize, for the most part, in your, in your maps as Palestine. And so when it says Palestine, you, the, those are the boundaries you recognize because they were divided between the sons and the tribes and we've all seen maps of the land as it was divided and given to each of the sons and tribes. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 26 and following, you find Moses is attempting uh, to get passage through King Sihon's land. All right, uh, that's uh, that is land and to the land across the Jordan that God has given him. All right, uh, why if it's given to him, why is he having to negotiate passage for it? Because it was not part of the promised land that God intended for them to inhabit as the tribal group. All right, now. This is where we have over here, this is where the problem 
comes to a head. And that is um, in Ezekiel chapter 30. Ezekiel, excuse me, they're not, they're not two Ezekiels. So it's Ezekiel chapter 34 through 48. These are, we, we've talked about this before. Uh, this is where uh, the millennial kingdom is going, they believe, the pre millennials believe. If the millennial kingdom the talk, is, talk, is discussed in these uh, 15 chapters, uh, yeah, some 14, 15 chapters. Um, and it will include uh, when, when it's finally, when God finally reaches the end, he will have such things as David on the throne. We talked about that earlier. And the entire land promise will be given to the Israelites, okay? Or his children. Now, if you look at chapter, uh, Ezekiel chapter 47, beginning in verse 13, we will not read this, but please make a note of it. Uh, verses 13 through 18. The millennial believes that the scripture, I'm sorry, the millennial believes that the, this scripture applies to the millennium. This is the boundaries. These are the boundaries that the premillennialist believes Israel will receive when Christ comes back and restores the kingdom and sets up the earthly kingdom and, and all that for the thousand years. Now, here are the borders. Again, with a map, it's a little easier. Sorry, I can't provide that for you, but please look it up. Um, the eastern border, according to Ezekiel, will be the Jordan River. The northern border will be Hamath. The southern border will be the waters of Meribah Kadesh. And the western border is the Mediterranean Sea. Guess what? That's the exact borders that Numbers 34 talks about. Therefore, if Israel didn't receive the land promise in Numbers 34, remember they said in Numbers 34 that they haven't received all the land yet. When the millennial kingdom comes, when the millennial kingdom comes, those are the borders they're going to receive according to Ezekiel chapter 47. Which means that if they didn't get it when it was first promised in Numbers, okay, when the millennial kingdom comes, they still don't get it. Because this is the scripture they use to establish what the millennial kingdom will cover. What are we saying all this for? We're saying it for this reason. That in spite of all their effort to convince people that God has not fulfilled his promise. That the land, that the land is still out there to be given to Israel. That Israel will not receive the land until the millennial kingdom comes into existence. The reality is that even within the scriptures they want to use, it doesn't work. Now, why would they do all, why would they go to all this trouble? Unfortunately, millennial people, and, and many of them well-meaning, I, I have no I know people who, I know, I have even some very good friends that are premillennials in their thinking and to a large extent. And part of the problem, I believe, is that they've never thought through the issues. In other words, they've never looked at it this way. The people who promote premillennialism are not showing them these scriptures. Okay? They're showing them the other scriptures and leaving these out. Why? Well, once you decide something, be it biblical or whatever, 
once you decide something, then you begin to arrange the facts to fit what you what you believe. We see this in our country today. We're seeing history retold to fit an agenda that certain individuals want to have. And who cares about the facts? What, I'm, what I want you to see is this is the way I believe it should be. Unfortunately, the millennial millennialists have fallen into this trap to a large extent. Now, does that mean that the that people who wrote the book, like John Wolfworth and uh, how, uh, Mr. Lindsay and so forth, are they crooks? Are they terrible? Wait, not necessarily. Now, there's money being made here, and I think that's a fact. But the problem is that they went, they've gone through the material in Scripture with already the biased uh, belief <clears throat> that the Israelites, for example, using today's lesson, have not received all the land. They do that because they need something for them to get in the millennium. I mean, why have a millennium if they don't get something out of it? They, so they say they're going to get the land. Now, I've already made up my mind that they haven't got it all. So now I'm going to find scriptures that will validate my position as I use it, more likely taken out of context, but nonetheless used to prove my point. Um, now, lest we jump on these nice people too hard, and I do believe they're wrong, I believe that there's ample scripture here to show that the premillennial position is wrong. My brethren in the body of Christ have done similar things on not necessarily uh, as big a scale. But I'm going to give you a quick example and then we'll close for tonight. Tonight we'll pick up the, we'll talk about the duration next week, we'll cover the scope this week. All right. Many of you, I know I did. My, I was taught this growing up, by, not necessarily by teachers, but by my parents and others. Then you can only have church if you got if you got a small group because it says in the Bible, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of. So yeah, I gotta have two people to have church. And you can't have a one person church. Because it clearly says, where two or three get together, they're in the midst of, therefore I cannot be in the midst of one person, and therefore you can't have an assembly on a one person church service. Right? And But if you've got two, we're, we're clear, we're good. And it clearly says that in scripture. I mean, that verse is actually there. I quoted it. It's in Hebrews, and you probably know that. But you can look it up, and that's exactly what it says. Now, I will ask you to look it up and notice the context that it's in. Because the Hebrew writer is talking about going and correcting your brother. And therefore, you don't go by yourself. You take two or three with you there were two or three are gathered together in my name there I am in the midst of. Worship is not the issue in that verse. There's other verses in the Hebrews about worship, but that's not one of them. So how did we get to where two or three are gathered together in my name means we can have church? Well, because that fit our agenda for having church. And we have a verse that backs it up and somebody used it that way. <laughs> and we all bought into it. And it's not wrong. I mean, you know, it's not wrong that two or two or three get to get money. They're in the midst of it. That's true. That is fact because that's what the book says. But in reference to what is the issue? Now, I, I'm not here to challenge anybody's thinking about 
that you may choose to continue to believe that it refers to worship and that's fine with me. I don't think it matters one way or the other. What I'm making the point though is that when you come into, when you come in with an idea that you want something to be a certain way, then you begin to find scripture to validate your position and not necessarily to find out what the truth is. Unfortunately, with the premillennial people, many of them, <clears throat> first of all, many of them don't have a clue why they believe what they believe, other than the, the preacher on TV said so. I know because I have challenged these people to back up and go, how do you know that's what, I'm not, I'm not questioning that that's what the Bible says, because it does say it what, exactly what you said it said. But is that the context? And when you start asking and probing, uh, they begin to back off quickly because they don't know. They don't know why they believe that. That's what the preacher said. Uh, you know, you will find, they'll have problems, they'll tell you that uh, such and such happened. I'm going to use the one I used in the beginning just to keep the illustration going. <clears throat> but you remember I told you about uh, an individual who had a book that someone had written, I don't know who it was, some well-known premillennial scholar, no doubt, that said that it was prophesied in scripture. And he had book, chapter, and verse for it. I didn't read the books. I don't know what they were. Book, chapter, and verse that um, Donald Trump would defeat Hillary Clinton in the election. Well, how do you get there? Well, you take scripture out of context and you say, see, this means this, this means that, therefore. But was it in context or out? Of, and then you start pursuing that further and you say, okay, let's read the verses around that verse. Let's see what the writer was talking about. Well, all of a sudden, they're going to use another phrase. We'll talk about this a little bit later on in our, in our series. But there is there is such a thing called double application. And they are well aware of that. And they will use that forever. And that means that it meant one thing back then, but it also meant what it means today. And it was a double application. We would say, I would say, no, it was fulfilled back then and has no bearing on what's going on today at all. But they will make the double application argument. And uh, there is some there is some validity to double application. There are double application prophecies. I'm not saying there aren't, but even they are fulfilled within scripture. They had an application back then. Then they had a second, possibly a second application in the time of Christ and the church. But even at that, they were still fulfilled within biblical times. So, what are we saying? We're saying that people come in with an agenda already in mind and they begin to try to validate their point. If you take scripture without your, pre, without your predisposition of what it means, I don't believe there's any way that the lack of fulfillment of the land promise will hold up in scope. Uh, because Joshua clearly says it's been fulfilled. All the promises have been that God made thus far. He's been faithful and fulfilled. Jeremiah, uh, Nehemiah, excuse me. Nehemiah further states the same thing. So it's not really as good an argument for their side or from their standpoint as they would make you believe. But please understand. That if you listen to them on TV or read their books, they make a convincing argument. But the reason they make the convincing argument is because they pick and choose the verses they want to use to make their point valid. And when you do that, you'll almost always end up with a problem somewhere down the line. And it can happen to us, it can happen 
in the denominational world. We need to be we need to be equally careful when we make statements about this is what God said that we're using scripture in context and not taking it out of context. All right. I appreciate your time. You're getting out a little bit early tonight, but next week we'll look at the duration of the land promise and it will even, it will be even more interesting than the scope because there, there's some words there that are going to, I think, change your thinking on some things. So I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.